Okay, so if you've been with me before, you know I'm real big into education. Not only parent education with respect to biomedical intervention, but physician education too. So if you're a doc out there listening to this, uh, this is a big part of what I do uh, professionally. There are two excellent books that I recommend you have in your library. The book on the left, Autism Effective Biomedical Treatments by Dr. Pangborn and Baker, is a really excellent reference book not something you'd read cover to cover, but it's something that you can go to and pick up if you have a specific question about a supplement or a biochemical reaction. The book on the right by Dr. Shaw was one of the first books that I read. This is actually a newer edition here. Excellent information with respect to dietary intervention, the toxicity of clostridia and yeast, and the biochemistry behind all that. Great information from him. <clears throat> Dr. Shaw actually has another book Autism Beyond the Basics, another excellent book as well. I have a chapter in this book too. A little bit more in-depth information, great chapter in hyperbaric, excellent chapter on inflammatory bowel problems in autism. So another worthwhile thing to have in your library. <clears throat> I have a number of websites online and the associates that I work with have spent a tremendous amount of time putting these together. This is a free video blog site called autismrecoverytreatment.com where I shoot short videos that are then transcribed into articles and placed on this site on a wide variety of different biomedical topics. So you can go to autismrecoverytreatment.com and by the way you can just sign up here, name an email address and you, you will then be notified of upcoming uh, specials that we have going on this summer. I also have a very active subscription website called AutismActionPlan.com where I work with parents um, throughout the U.S. And, and around the world just talking about biomedical intervention. If they have a question about something, um, they want me to look at a supplement, they want me to help brainstorm, troubleshoot an issue they may be having, whether you're working with a doctor or you're doing this alone, I'm there to help in the process. I'm on this website on a daily basis weekends, on holidays, um, etc. So this is a great place to access me on a daily basis if you choose. Also, members of this site will also receive discounts if you choose to consult with me in person. And in person means I do provide in office as well as phone and Skype consulting. Um, members of the Autism Action Plan actually get discounts through my office too. Okay. Number of other things, I have a, a supplement information website at Autism Supplement Center. You can go here. I've shot a number of different videos on the different supplements that I use in practice, how I use them, how to dose them, uh, what you can see when they're used, etc. <clears throat> I've also have a number of sites that help interpret lab tests. So if you've done lab testing, let's say you've done some Great Plains lab testing before in your child, and you just really feel like you haven't got it explained to you, you're not really quite sure what the markers mean, those labs can be sent to me. And I do a specific video lab review where I sit down with your child's labs and I shoot a video. And I explain what the markers mean, what's important, what's not important, and then make you know, some treatment and supplement recommendations from there. <clears throat> I recently have a new book, Autism, uh, The Road to Recovery. And you can go to autismrecoverybook.com. Um, we're running a special through the summer. It's $12 off. You have to use this code that's listed here, which is ARTRS2012, uh, and that'll give you the discounted price. That was just that just came out yesterday. And then again, if you want to sign up through this the website for this particular book then you'll be notified via email of upcoming specials that we have with respects to other books, video presentations, lecture slides, etc. Um, and by the way, this, as I mentioned before, for anybody who's come on late, this particular presentation that we're going to be discussing tonight is available on this website here at Autism Seminars On Demand. And then finally, to access more general information about me, um, as well as a, it's, this is a hub, this is like the central hub of, of all the different things that we've created. 
you can go to drwiller.com and then link off from there to the different websites that we have. Or if you just want to find out more about who I am and um, where I practice, etc. So I'm actually currently um, seeing patients in Southern California um, in Temecula, just north of San Diego. I also see patients once a month in Sacramento, California, and also am establishing a practice in Oregon, in Bend, Oregon. So I'm actually covering a lot of the West Coast with my consultation services in person, but I'm also available for office, excuse me, Skype and phone consulting as well. So here's what the lecture is going to be about tonight. We're going to talk about methylation. We're going to explain it a bit. We're going to talk about specific supplement support. I'm going to touch on methyl B12 therapy. And then we're going to go in depth into cerebral folate deficiency, the issue with folate chemistry, receptor testing, and folate therapy. So first off, we need a foundation on methylation. What are methyl groups? Well, methyl groups, they don't just function um, as building blocks, they help to regulate gene expression, which is important for genetic memory. They help to promote um, gene memory into action for protein production. So they have a regulating effect over the cellular function with respect to our body. <clears throat> and all of this is incredibly important because it helps influence our biochemistry, our brain function, our immune function. We don't exist if we don't have good methylation chemistry. This is what a methyl group is. Essentially, a methyl group is one carbon with three hydrogens, and it's attached to something else. Okay, So this R is representing some other type of molecule. The process of methylation is that we're transferring this methyl group from one chemical to the next. If, if we think about something like dopamine or serotonin, it's regulating the effectiveness of dopamine and serotonin in the central nervous system, it turns out that the methylation cycle and, and this biochemistry is critically important with respect to what we know is going on medically in autism. <clears throat> I, I've written, um, I've been a big fan of Dr. Newbrander's work with respect to methyl B12 therapy for many years. I actually have a guidebook on the implementation of methyl B12 that you can access through methylb 12 for autismcom And this is a step-by-step -step guide. I'll touch on some of it here tonight, but it's a step-by-step -step guide on where you can obtain it, how to implement it, what you see, side effects, benefits, etc. Uh, it's all contained within this book. This book will actually uh, will have a discounted price starting tomorrow. So if it's something you're interested in getting, I'd wait till tomorrow. Um, and go to the, uh, the Methyl B12 for Autism site for that. <clears throat> so the methylation cycle. You've probably seen a lot of diagrams with respect to this. This was my version here. What we're going to talk about here specifically is moving from homocysteine to methionine um, and talk a little bit about these two individual pathways, one through Methyl B12 through this methionine synthase complex, and the other the conversion of TMG to DMG. Basically, if we look at it graphically, this thing moves in a clockwise fashion. We're moving from homocysteine to methionine, and then downstream we have a lot of biochemical influence on sleep, immune function, attention, focusing. And then as things move downwards um, from homocysteine, we have a direct support with respect to glutathione, which is very important because it's a very potent antioxidant at the cellular level. We can have breaks at any point along this pathway, uh, and that will have a negative biochemical pro, uh, influence on things that we see. This is not something that's specifically unique with respect to autism, because there's many people that have you know, genetic influences and environmental influences over, over the methylation cycle. Cardiovascular disease, for example, um, can be a problem that can occur if the methylation cycle isn't working, but it's definitely something we see quite prevalent in autism. Okay, and this is just sort of reiterating what I had just already, what I had mentioned. It's a very key biochemical pathway, often broken or disrupted in autism. Um, <clears throat> when we're specifically talking about autism, it, it has specific effects on what you may see as a parent. Lack of awareness, language issues, lack of eye contact, diminished environmental awareness, 
potential immune problems, uh, child not seemingly detoxifying things effectively, and then just overall brain chemistry imbalances. When we start talking about methylation, we have to talk with the methylation cycle, we have to talk about methionine. Methionine is that central amino acid pathway that's needed to support this overall um, this biochemical chain reaction. It's called an essential amino acid because it, it, we need to obtain it from food. Our body can't make it on its own. Eggs, milk, turkey, almonds exa are examples of foods that have methionine. It supplies a steady supply of methyl groups to get this process started, and it also supplies sulfur. Now, sulfur is important <clears throat> because sulfur is critically involved in our body's mechanism with respect to ridding ourselves of toxins, as well as helping to maintain the proper shape and flexibility of proteins. You have to figure proteins mean our immune system, proteins mean our cardiovascular system, proteins mean um, you know, our musculoskeletal, our intestinal system, so it has a tremendous influence on all of, on all of those different systems in the body. <clears throat> so really when we're talking about methylation, we're specifically talking about methylation and sulfation. It is the most common damaged biochemical pathway in children with autism. So we have to have a, a, a real true understanding of what's happening here, okay? So let's, let's move forward. We're going to go through this very quickly, and this is methionine metabolism, and <clears throat> where we're going to start is we're going to start at region one, and we're going to move to methionine to region two, region three, and move throughout this cycle. Okay, region one is where we're converting methionine to something called SAMI. SAMI stands for S-adenosyl methionine. In order to make that conversion, let me just go back real quickly. So we're sitting here at methionine at region one, and we're moving from methionine to region two. And we're making SAMI. In order to make that happen, we have to have a lot of ATP. ATP is that energy currency in the cell there is a lack of ATP or a possible lack of ATP in the brain of individuals with autism. If we don't have enough ATP, we can't make enough SAMI. Another thing that can happen is we need magnesium in order to make that process work as well. ATP is that fuel source that comes from the mitochondria, these little energy factories inside our cells. And we know that there is a lot of evidence now to show that Many kids on the autism spectrum tend to have mitochondrial issues. They don't necessarily have a mitochondrial disease, but they can have a mitochondrial imbalances because of environmental influences and toxicity that they may have been exposed to. And that will directly impact ATP, that energy currency um, production at the cellular level, and therefore affect metabolism and brain function and immune function and in this case, affect methylation. What happens is, is that SAMI, if we're able to make SAMI, SAMI then moving to region two, loses its methyl group, and it becomes a chemical called SAH, S-adenosyl homocysteine. About 70% of the methyl group that's lost goes towards, in this reaction, goes towards the production of creatine. Creatine is critically important as a fuel source for the muscles, but it's also a fuel source for the brain. 30% of SAMI is used for the methylation of other things, melatonin, histamine, <clears throat> DNA activity, carnitine regulation, which helps with fat transport, fat absorption. So it, it has a, an influence on a number of different things. So here, here we are again. We're sitting at methionine, and we're moving to SAMI. Now we're trying to get SAMI to move down towards homocysteine to keep this clock, to keep this cycle moving. Well, it turns out that the main reaction in trying to move S-adenosyl homocysteine, SAH, to homocysteine is a methylation reaction as well. 
<clears throat> what happens is, is in that process, we produce something called adenosine. Adenosine is a disposal chemical of this reaction. Adenosine is actually part of this SAH complex. So if we can get rid of adenosine, SAH becomes homocysteine. Okay? So our end product here is we want homocysteine. <clears throat> well, it turns out that adenosine has a converting enzyme called ADA, adenosine deaminase. And when we convert adenosine, deamin uh, adenosine through adenosine deaminase, we produce inosine and ammonia. Well, these are spill products, ammonia we need to get rid of. Um, <clears throat> so this is an important reaction to have. The problem is, is that ADA, adenosine deaminase, has some issues with it. Oops, let me go back, sorry. Okay. ADA is a zinc-containing protein. Turns out that zinc deficiency is quite common in autism. Okay, it's common in other things too, but it's common in autism. ADA is also likely weak in autism too because of certain genetic influences over the enzyme. ADA has two parts. It has an enzyme and a binding protein. The ADA binds lymphocytes, and that's part of the specific enzyme that we hear about called DPP4. DPP4 is what helps us to, to break down gluten and casein. So if we have a problem with ADA, we might have a problem with DPP4 activity and vice versa. If we have something that's affecting DPP4, it could influence a certain percentage of, of that ADA converting enzyme. <clears throat> It turns out that DPP4 is inhibited by pesticides as well as heavy metals, mercury and lead specifically. Okay? So if we have mercury and lead toxicity, pesticide toxicity, we can adversely affect this enzyme, which then adversely affects the methylation cycle. Milk allergy can cause a 25% reduction of activity of DPP4 activity in the gut. So again, we can have a direct influence just based on milk allergy to our methylation cycle, and as we get into the cerebral folate discussion, you'll see how milk sensitivity can influence that too. It turns out, as I mentioned before, that ADA comes in two versions, ADA1 and ADA2. It turns out that in autism, they tend to have a higher percentage of the form of this ADA enzyme that doesn't work so well, okay, where it's, <clears throat> where it's about 8% in the general population, about 18% in the autistic population. So we can see right there, there's a, a, a genetic weakness, essentially, in the function of that particular enzyme. So we've got multiple things that can influence that enzyme, and then, therefore, that has a direct negative influence on the methylation cycle. Okay, now we're moving from, and we're going back here to region four again. Okay, so we're back at region four trying to move from S adenosyl homocysteine to homocysteine. What happens is, is that some of the homocysteine, when we're sitting at that position, um, <clears throat> will, will flow downstream to eventually become glutathione. Okay, it first becomes something called cystothionine, then cysteine, and then cysteine helps get converted into glutathione, which is great because we want glutathione as that cellular antioxidant. The problem is, is that in autism, it's been observed that glutathione is often very low, and some, many times so is cysteine. <clears throat> we know that B6 is necessary to help convert in that process of moving homocysteine down to glutathione. And we know that many individuals on the spectrum tend to have B6 vitamin problems. So many times they'll need more B6 than just, say, the general population. Also, through toxicity issues, <clears throat> glutathione tends to get depleted because of metal toxins, infections, environmental issues going on. Um, glutathione tends to get used up pretty quickly. So it can cause a little bit more of a pull or a drain on the system trying to get more glutathione produced, and that puts a drain on the methylation cycle in general. <clears throat> so 
if everything's working right, everything's in balance, we have plenty of methylation support up top, and we have plenty of glutathione uh, production support downstream. Well, if we're sitting at homocysteine now, okay, and we're moving, we want to move the methylation cycle back up, back up to the methionine, there's a few things and a few ways that we can do that. Let me just check on something real quick here. Okay. And remember, it's a balance between the two. We've got the methylation cycle balance, and we've got the sulfation chemistry balance of the production and adequate supply of glutathione. But in this scenario, we want to move from homocysteine back upstream to methionine. Okay, just a couple ways we can do it. <clears throat> we can move that methylation cycle through a process called TMG into DMG, which you likely heard about as two supplements often used. Or we can use methylcobalamin through this enzyme complex called methionine synthase. The first way where we're converting homocysteine to methionine uses specifically TMG. The second route is using <coughs> um, 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, or 5-methylfolate, we'll talk about that, to help methylate cobalamin. Okay? It turns out that DMG also helps supply, um, it, it basically helps in the, in, the, in the folate chemistry as well, and so we'll see how these things tie together. Okay, so here we are. Our first route is a conversion of TMG to DMG, and that helps us move homocysteine to methionine. And then we've got homocysteine moving through the methionine synthase complex with the help of methyl B12 to become methionine. <clears throat> Mother Nature was pretty smart. She realized that this reaction was incredibly important. And so there's a backup ne mechanism in case one system isn't working right. Okay? There's, a, there's another way of getting there. Well, there's a few things that can happen. What's called BHMT, betaine homocysteine methyl transferase. This is our first route. All right? This is our first go around, if you will, of moving homocysteine to methionine through this TMG to DMG reaction. It turns out that this enzyme is uh, high sensitivity to zinc. We need, it's, it's very dependent upon zinc. So if there's zinc deficiencies, therefore we might have a problem in this enzyme. It also has a lot of cysteine, which what that means is, is that it's a sulfur-containing amino acid, cysteine is. Sulfur-containing amino acids have a high affinity to heavy metals. So heavy metals like mercury and arsenic and antimony will seek out amino acids that are high in sulfur. <clears throat> so this enzyme can become dysfunctional just because of the presence of heavy metal toxicity as well as zinc deficiency. Well, there can also be problems in the methionine synthase complex. This is our secondary pathway, or I guess our, our second scenario here. Methylcobalamin B12, we'll talk about methyl B12, is part of the methionine synthase complex and it helps to convert homocysteine to methionine. The methyl B12 in this complex is recycled by 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, methylfolate or 5-methylfolate, which is the active form of folate. It turns out, as researched by Dr. Deeth from Northeast, uh, Northeastern University, <clears throat> this enzyme or enzyme complex, it too is inhibited and affected adversely by heavy metals. Mercury, antimony, thimerosal, which is the mercury found in vaccines, inflammation, oxidative stress. Anytime you have heavy metal toxicity, you're generally going to have oxidative stress and likely inflammation. Chronic infections will drive inflammation, which will drive oxidative stress. So a lot of things will impact this system. So how do we resolve the issue? Well, one way may be to help improve digestion by doing things like the DPP-4 enzyme. In doing DPP-4, it helps to remove adenosine, which 
creates a more functional state to our methylation cycle so that it keeps flowing in, that, in, that, in the right direction and not getting bogged down. Metal detoxification, avoiding milk and casein from a food allergy standpoint, using high dose B6. There's a lot of different protocols for that. This is just one example I have here. We can help move this system along by using things like DMG and TMG um, to help convert more homocysteine to methionine. <clears throat> we can do methylcobalamin therapy. Um, we can do folate therapy. And we can specifically do methyl B12 therapy, which has been a mainstay in my practice for many years. We'll get there shortly. Let's talk about DMG first. DMG, dimethylglycine, has been a supplement that's been used for, for many years, in many cases with good success. It's derived from TMG. It has an influence over folate metabolism, which we'll talk about next in the next section here. <clears throat> and so it influences um, folate in these different versions of folate, because there's a number of different steps that it has to go through. It helps in proper conversion and proper metabolism of things called purines. One purine, for example, is ATP, that energy currency we need. Um, and pyrimidines to help with genetic influences, those cellular responses and perception, those proper mechanisms with respect to um, <clears throat> uh, you know, gene performance, protein production, etc. It also has an influence in the methylation cycle um, with respect to cobalamin, and it helps overall just in keeping things moving as far as the, the methylation cycle goes in general. Some of the benefits that are seen clinically, improved speech, less stimming, reduced hyperactivity and irritability, although that's not 100%, but there's nothing that always gives 100% positive benefit all the time. Typical dosage is anywhere between 125 to 900 milligrams plus. Um, it's not based on a specific age or weight, so you sort of have to just use uh, and start at a certain level and use, use it to see what kind of response you get with your child. However, on average, you know, a 40 to 50 pound child may use anywhere between 300 to 700 milligrams per day. It tends to work pretty well. I usually tend to give this in the morning um, to see how your kids might respond to it. <clears throat> New Beginnings Nutritionals has a good version of DMG. It comes in a little chewable tablet. <coughs> Anywhere between one to six tablets daily. On average, two to three tablets, you know, best given in the morning, it's been my experience. Okay. TMG. Did I miss something here? Let me go back. Yeah, okay. TMG or trimethylglycine, tri means three, so three methyl groups, um, <clears throat> also helps in the conversion of homocysteine to methionine. TMG becomes DMG after donating one of its methyl groups to homocysteine. The general recommendation if you're going to use TMG is start with a low dose, and I'd recommend that even with DMG. It's, it's, it seems to be a good idea to have taurine in place. And the reason is, if you remember, homocysteine, think about it this way. Homocysteine is sitting at 6 o'clock on a clock face. Methionine is sitting at 12 o'clock. And if it was a grandfather clock, you'd have those little, uh, that pendulum that swings back and forth, that hangs down. <clears throat> well, that pendulum is glutathione, okay? And it's swinging back and forth, back and forth, sending information back up to the methionine or to the methylation cycle that it needs support. It needs some additional um, juice in order to, to keep the glutathione supply around. Well, if you start stimulating methylation cycle and you start pulling homocysteine up to methionine from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you might put a drain on how much glutathione is getting produced as well as some of these other sulfur-containing amino acids like taurine, which is part of, that, part of that food chain. So what's been found clinically is you have a little bit of taurine in place down below. 
and you start giving TMG, you're not going to run into some of the erratic behavior that you might see where kids become overstimulated, uh, agitated, hyperactive um, when you use something like TMG. Now you can get that same reaction sometimes with DMG too, but it really seems to kick in in some kids with TMG. <clears throat> so that's why they recommend, and I've used in my practice, having you know some taurine, 250-500 milligrams a day seems to do just fine. <clears throat> and this is just some general recommendation dosing for TMG. On average for a 40 to 50 pound child, about 250 you know, to 800 milligrams a day, usually 250 to 500 milligrams seems to work just well. One side note, if you find um, when you use TMG and your child's situation worsens, okay, <clears throat> and you haven't implemented taurine, for example, I would generally stop the TMG, add in some taurine, and then re, you know, maybe give that a week or so, and then retry the DMG later. And New Beginnings carries TMG as a powder as well. Well, what about methylcobalamin? Let's talk about this, because um, this is a very profound therapy for many kids. The bottom line is methyl B12 helps in detoxification, mental processing, language expression, uh, personal awareness, in, improved social skills in many kids. The main areas that seem to be helped is improvement in cerebral cortex function, higher cognitive function, speech and language sometimes are spurred on, um, and kids sometimes be, have more emotional stability and socialization function. These are the syringes. If this is, some, if this is new information to you, this, it, what I'm talking about specifically here is methyl B12 injection therapy. They're pre-filled syringes. They come from a number of different compounding pharmacies around the country. They're all based on weight of your child. Um, and they're given through an insulin needle. So they come pre-filled, and this, this is the one pharmacy I use. They come in this little blue bag. <clears throat> so you get a supply. Okay, a typical, a typical month supply would be ten, um, yeah, 10 syringes. Placement of the injection is critical. When we're talking about methyl B12 injection therapy in autism, we're using it subcutaneous, underneath the skin. And in this scenario, we're using it underneath the skin and the buttocks, the upper outer quadrant of the buttocks, that pocket area. <clears throat> you can think of it similar to insulin. A diabetic would inject insulin underneath the skin, okay, in their abdomen. The reason they're doing that is they're trying to get that insulin subcutaneous to where it will stay in that area for a period of time and then be slowly released into the bloodstream to help maintain blood sugar. Because the last thing you want for anybody who has diabetes is wide swings in their blood sugar. That's what causes the problems, as well as wide swings in their blood levels of insulin. The same thing with methyl B12. Methyl B12 is a water-soluble vitamin. It doesn't get stored up in the body, so it doesn't have uh, a toxic effect. It doesn't have a buildup effect in the body it will get metabolized very quickly and then whatever isn't used will be urinated out of the uh, out of the system through our urine well the last thing we want to have happen is these fluctuating levels of methyl b12 where the levels swing up and then they swing down they swing up and then they swing down and we're always looking for consistency and from my experience as well as many other physicians the methyl b12 subcutaneous injection i feel is truly the gold standard it still is the preferred way of doing it because of the consistency you get, because of the, the clinical experience that has been established over many, many years now in the, the proper doses based on weight with a specific timing and a sequence of using it. <clears throat> and it tends to give very good results, in many respects good positive results in about 94% of kids that use it. <clears throat> so. It takes a little while 
to, to understand, uh, not to understand, but it, it takes a little bit of self-education about how to do it. That Method B12 for Autism book that I have goes through this step by step. Dr. Newbrander on his website also has information about the implementation of Methyl B12. And um, <clears throat> for me, it's, it's, it's ideally the way to go. I do have scenarios in my practice where we just couldn't do the Methyl B12 injections. Um, whether logistically it didn't work out or we had a child that was just, it was, it was so stressful, it created so much anxiety, it just wasn't an option. So there are other forms. <clears throat> the Revitapop is a lollipop of methyl B12. And it works pretty good. Um, I, I think it's a, a viable option for some kids. And uh, it's a lollipop. They, 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 you know, they want to chew it, so they want to suck on it. They figure that maybe what's happening is that the methyl B12 is being absorbed from the mouth and having a direct influence through the bloodstream through the brain. Um, so the Revitapop, you know, at least one a day, um, seems to work pretty well. Taking straight oral B12 might work, but it doesn't work as well as the injections. However, New Beginnings has something called Methylmate. Methylmate can be converted into a nasal spray. What do you do is you, when you order the Methylmate, is you request on their website or you give them a call that they send a nasal applicator. You take off the cap from the bottle, you replace it with a nasal applicator, and now the bottle becomes a nasal spray. Each spray is approximately 500 micrograms. What's difficult is how, knowing how much to give. When we give the injection, we know based on weight how much to give. And the injections in the beginning with methyl B12 injections are, are given every three days. So 64.5 micrograms per kilogram body weight is the dosage that you would use per injection. But when you're talking about a nasal spray, it has a different, a, a different absorption. Um, so because it's going through the nose, it's going to get absorbed much more quickly than, let's say, the injections will. So the question always comes up, do you do it every three days, every two days, do it every day, do you do it multiple times throughout the day? Because with the injections we know, hey, start it, one injection every three days, we'll follow it, we may increase the frequency, we might increase the dose over time. But with a nasal spray, it's variable. One thing is, is some kids like getting a nasal spray and other kids don't. Um, it, it could depend on the time of the year. There's a lot of allergies this time of year, so a lot of kids have a lot of boogers in their nose. And they may not get as much methyl B12 absorbed from their nose as, you know, at, a, at another time. So it's, it's variable. It doesn't always match up perfectly with what we see with the injections, but it is an option. And so generally what I, what I do if we're using the nasal spray is I'll start with one spray, usually each nostril per day, and then work it up from there. Um, usually for kids who are 40, 50 pounds, maybe you know, 60 pounds, um, two sprays per nostril per day seems to work pretty well. Okay, so a little bit, a little bit more um, sort of figuring out when you're doing the methyl B12 nasal spray. <clears throat> All right, what are some side effects of methyl B12? Well, like anything that you can give kids on the spectrum, hyperactivity is the number one thing. Um, sometimes sleep disturbance, sometimes mouthing of objects. These things usually occur, if they do occur, within the first week of giving the therapy and can last anywhere between four to six weeks. Usually I see them anywhere between two to four weeks. Um, so they don't happen all the time, but hyperactivity is one of the most common things. I don't see an increase in seizures or heart problems or kidney problems, you don't see those kinds of reactions. It's more behavioral things. The one thing that I do not want to see, really with any therapy I give, but something like Method B12, is aggression and self-injurious behavior. If that's occurring, then that's something that you need to let your doctor know about because from my standpoint, that's an intolerable side effect. And that's a problem that, that I want to know about and, and explore it with the parents to figure out what might be going on. Okay? Um, 
most kids tolerate methyl B12 just fine, but some kids every once in a while on a rare occasion don't. Okay, so uh, for me that would be a situation if I saw a child becoming aggressive or self-injurious, then I would tend to discontinue it and try to figure out uh, what might be happening. Let me get a drink here real quick, sorry. Okay, so methyl B12 injections are one of the, I shouldn't use the word easiest, but um, are one of the more doable advanced therapies um, to implement, and they're also relatively inexpensive, certainly when you compare it to many supplement therapies out there. There is no specific test to tell you yes, do methyl B12 injections, or no, do methyl B12 injections, in my experience. Uh, doing a blood test for methyl B12 isn't going to tell you much, because um, the reality is, is, even if the blood levels were high, it doesn't tell you what's happening at the cellular level. <clears throat> so this truly is a therapy that the test for it is to do it. And uh, minimally, I feel it, it should be done for a couple months, you could say, you know, maybe six weeks um, as a trial, but, you know, this is one of those things you ever, every once in a while you'll have kids that they're slow responders, they're delayed responders of things, and uh, using it for a longer period of time, you know, two to three months would be preferred. Okay, so that, summer, that, that talks about the methylation part. Let's now dive into the cerebral folate deficiency issues and really try to understand a little bit about the science and clinical applications for folinic acid and methylfolate supplementation. Now, we really need to, uh, you know, thank Dr. Rosengall and Dr. Fry, um, two exceptional biomedical physicians, um, for bringing this information to the autism community. <clears throat> what we're talking about with respect to cerebral folate deficiency is that folate is not being transported into the brain. And we're specifically talking about 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, also called 5-THF, or methyl THF, or 5-methyl THF. This is the form that crosses the blood-brain barrier. It's highly concentrated in the cerebral spinal fluid compared to the blood. In order for the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to get in, it needs to bind itself to things called folate receptors in the brain and then be trans transported by a carrier mechanism called the reduced folate carrier. Now the reduced folate carrier again is powered by ATP. Remember we talked about ATP in the methylation cycle specifically with the conversion of methionine to SAMI. Okay. <clears throat> well here it is again. You need ATP to make all this stuff work right. This is all the machinery, if you will, of our body and it, we need energy to do it. So we need to put some gasoline in the gas tank to make the car run. These folate receptors are located throughout the body. We have them in the intestine, we have them in the brain, the lungs, the kidneys, and the thyroid. So you can imagine if we've got damage in some of these places, why that might impact on folate absorption. So the reduced folate carrier carries folate through the intestinal barrier as well as from the cerebral spinal fluid in to various nerve cells and you know from uh, from the from the blood into the uh, into the brain the inability to transport folate unfortunately can manifest as a number of different uh, a number of different issues what we call cerebral folate deficiency Rett syndrome and autism <clears throat> there can be blocking antibodies to folate transport and these tend to be autoimmune reactions. Auto meaning self, immune system meaning the immune system, meaning the immune system is now attacking our body tissue or a, 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 a certain structure in our body. And in this case, these blocking and binding antibodies um, are attacking the folate transporter. And so we're basically blocking the ability to transport 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate into the brain. <clears throat> Generally, low levels of cerebral, low, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, folate, 
have been seen with high values on the folate receptor test. That's not always the case. Sometimes low folate levels in the central uh, cerebral spinal fluid have been found when the titers, meaning the antibody markers, are low as well. So the test is definitely helpful, and when positive, certainly indicates a problem. But sometimes a negative test or a, a low marker test may not necessarily mean that there isn't an issue. Let me sidetrack here for a second with respect to folate metabolism. There's an enzyme called MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. There's two mutations. <clears throat> what this enzyme does is this enzyme helps to methylate folic acid okay, in its form, okay, in the form called 510 methylene THF. All right? The bottom line here is that this enzyme helps to convert a certain form of folate to become the active or the bioactive form of folate called 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. And then therefore that 5-methyltetrahydrofolate is involved in the methylation cycle, again, in the conversion of homocysteine to methionine. There's two mutations with respect to MTHFR. <clears throat> the normal pattern is this thing, you know, if we look at it, is C677. Most people will carry what's called a heterozygous mutation, where they have one amino acid on that sequence changed, and that becomes the C677T. So most people and a lot of kids on the spectrum have that too. The real serious one is the homozygous where both the amino acids are switched. And that's the, C, that's the 677TT. That's the worst scenario. The heterozygous isn't great because it certainly affects the function of MTHFR, but the C6, excuse me, the 677TT is much more severe. MTHFR is involved in the regulation of serotonin and dopamine. <clears throat> um, it, and problems in it have been associated with heart and cardiovascular disease, primarily through the issue of elevated homocysteine. And it's also been something we've seen with respect to autism, ADD, and other psychiatric conditions. Okay? So I just wanted to throw that in there because there is a, I wanted to show you that there's a converting mechanism that takes place with respect to the conversion of folate into its active form, and that's through this MTHFR. Well, if we get back and we talk about cerebral folate deficiency again, what's the population variance? Well, it seems to occur about in about 10 to 15 percent of the U.S. population. <clears throat> Just make sure my audio is coming through okay. There seems to be a high prevalence in um, people of Irish descent. And the treatment of cerebral folate deficiency is essential because antibodies will continue to rise and folate levels will continue to drop without adequate folate replacement. <clears throat> so the definition of cerebral folate deficiency, we could, we could think about it as maybe redefining it, if you will, um, could be any neurological or psychiatric disorder that's associated with low 5-methyltetrahydrofolate, the active form of folate found in the cerebral spinal fluid. <clears throat> most common cause is autoimmune. The problem is, is that most people are not running out and getting their cerebral spinal fluid analyzed. Uh, it's not practical. So <clears throat> many times we have to do it on clinical suspicion and looking at folate receptor activity. So who gets it? The condition was first described in the early 90s and was seen to correlate um, with, with some cases of autism about a, about a decade later. Like in autism, in other scenarios, there seems to be a higher male to female ratio. Um, and this is something that has been seen you know, in, in other studies as well with respect to autism, there seems to just be more boys than girls um, who are on the spectrum. Did I miss a slide there? Okay. 
<clears throat> cerebral folate deficiency, the onset occurs usually around the months of four to six months of age. You can start with behavioral changes, kids you know, having poor sleep, they're unsettled, they're easily agitated, they seem irritable. Uh, this can then later transition into growth problems, spastic limbs, low tone, balance issues, mental regression, seizures can develop. As a matter of fact, approximately a third of kids can develop seizures. Most of these problems seem to fully manifest by age two, but you have to have a clinical suspicion of it, and the doctor you're working with has to have a clinical suspicion of it as well. Cow milk appears to be a major offender because we're getting cross-reactivity with the folate receptors through these milk-derived proteins, and we develop what are called autoantibodies, um, these antibodies being produced against the folate receptor, whether they're binding to them or blocking, blocking them. The bottom line is, is we're affecting the ability to uptake active folate. So the elimination of cow's milk seems to have a significant uh, ability to lower um, the antibody reactivity to the folate receptors. Now this might be another reason why so many kids on the spectrum tend to do well with the casein-free diet. Clearly we know that the casein can have a morphine, a casomorphine, this peptide, this drug-like effect, but another reason we might see benefit um, and have seen benefit over the years from the casein-free diet is by releasing these antibodies off the folate receptor and we're uptaking folate more effectively. Other milk likely is an issue too, unfortunately. Things like camel or goat milk, at least this is what's being reported. And you know, I know there's a lot of kids out there doing camel milk and doing well with it, but it's just it's something to consider. But there's certainly been a lot of research to show that cow's milk is a real problem. I found this interesting, this particular research article. This was a um, 20 kids that were diagnosed with, with uh, cerebral folate deficiency. Seven had a diagnosis of autism. And 18 of the 20 kids had normal development during the first four months of life, followed by a deceleration of head growth over the next four to six month, months, behavioral problems, sleep problems, etc. When they tested them, nine of the 20 kids, about half, had low levels of something called 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid. Now, indolacetic acid, 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid, is the breakdown product of serotonin. We know that serotonin imbalances are also a major problem in autism. And what happened was, was through supplementation of folinic acid, their 5-HAA, their 5-hydroxyindolacetic acid levels return. So there's certainly a link between folate metabolism and serotonin metabolism. And this was just another study here talking about a specific girl who had regression, seizures, mental retardation. She, she had documented low levels of 5-methyltetrahydrofolate and through supplementation um, she had marked improvements over time. So who needs the therapy? Well, the evidence really points to the fact that all infants who manifest with signs and symptoms of CFD should at least be tested for the folate receptor antibodies or just undergo a treatment trial of, of folinic acid or 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. <clears throat> Irritability, restlessness, poor sleep, motor development, low muscle tone, balance problems, signs of autism, seizures, those would all be indicators of, for you as a parent or a caregiver or a doctor, if you have a patient, of consideration of using um, folate therapy as a treatment trial um, for your kids or if you're a physician for your patients. Well, let's talk about folate in general. What are folates? Folates are derived from plants, green leafy vegetables, grains, beans, certain yeast and bacteria also produce folates. Folates provide those methyl groups to cobalamin. Remember, cobalamin is within that methionine synthase complex that's needed to kind of help in that conversion of homocysteine to methionine. It's also involved in the, the regulation of cell function with respect to DNA. <clears throat> From a supplement standpoint, there's a number of different versions. Folinic acid is called 5-formyl tetrahydrofolate, 
and it's actually a versatile form of folate. It's a derivative um, that can be easily reduced to other forms, and it doesn't require this one specific converting enzyme called dihydro, dihydrofolate reductase um, activity. <clears throat> so it's a versatile form of folinic acid, and one reason that it's been used in uh, the treatment trials for cerebral folate deficiency. So there are a number of you know, different forms of folate that need a variety of different biochemical uh, manipulation. And each form has a, you know, its, its unique purpose. There are a wide variety of folate supplements. <clears throat> Deplin and 5-methyl folate we'll talk specifically because Deplin is a, is a prescription. 5-L-methyl uh, folate is a supplement you can get. These are the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is that active form. Okay, so whether it's called 5-methyl THF or 5-tetramethylfolate or L-methylfolate or just methylfolate, essentially we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the bioactive form of folate. Folinic acid is specifically 5-formyl tetrahydrofolate, which too is a versatile form. And honestly, sometimes you have to just you know, use one to see how your child reacts <clears throat> because you may not always know at face value you know, which, you know, which form to use specifically. But when it comes to the, to the studies um, and the treatments for cerebral folate deficiency, at this point primarily it's been folinic acid. Now as a, as a supplement, folinic acid uh, usually is found in either a 200 or 400 microgram capsule. New Beginnings carries a 400 microgram capsule. And in, in the past, I used to just give folinic acid, well, sometimes along with methyl B12, anywhere between 400 to 800 micrograms per day. Okay? There are th some things called the folate traps, which we need to be aware of, and you need to be aware of, at least you know, uh, have some idea about. Folate traps are places biochemically where various forms of folate accumulate because of certain enzyme defects. There's two examples. The reason I showed you the thing about the MTHFR is I wanted you to be aware that MTH, MTHFR can have problems with it, as we found out with the heterozygous or the homozygous mutation. If we have a mutation in MTHFR, we may not convert our folate effectively into 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And remember, it's the 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate which is the form that's necessary for the methylation of cobalamin to help move homocysteine to methionine. Also, cobalamin can become oxidized. If the cobalamin is altered as it's sitting in that methionine synthase complex, then unfortunately there's no place for 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate to go. Well, a lot of oxidative stress is certainly a problem we've seen in autism. In, in these cases, this is likely why we're seeing so much benefit with the methyl B12, because the methyl B12, in many respects, sort of helps to uh, jump gap or jump over this particular problem here to keep that methylation cycle flowing. <clears throat> so we know that folinic acid is a versatile form because it can be converted into different uh, forms of folate. 5-methyl folate, okay, it needs to meet up with reduced cobalamin within that methionine synthase complex to work effectively. And as I mentioned, if that cobalamin is oxidized, and unfortunately there's no specific commercial way to test for it, um, <clears throat> but if it's oxidized, we might have a problem with 5-methyl folate. So, if you have a situation where you've used this supplement and you feel like your child reacts negatively to it, it may be, and I don't know for sure, but it may be that their, their cobalamin in that methionine complex is oxidized. And so you may need to start looking at other, other ways of moving around it, using something like methyl B12, for example, or looking at other therapies that help to reduce oxidative stress. And that could be you know, heavy metal detox, that could be you know, working on gut function, decreasing infections, decreasing food sensitivities, etc. But we do find that methyl B12 is often very helpful for those kids getting uh, folate therapy. This is an example here of the folate receptor test. 
And it comes in um, looking at two things, what are called blocking antibodies and binding antibodies. Sometimes you'll just get blocking and no binding. Sometimes you'll get binding and no blocking. Sometimes you'll get both. Okay. <clears throat> the bottom line here is this is an autoimmune reaction occurring in the body to these folate receptors. So if they're positive, clearly there's an issue, and that issue generally is not going to go away uh, by doing nothing. And in that case, it really, for me, is a clear indication that we need to do more higher dose folate supplementation. There's one lab, uh, there's one lab you know, at the time of this particular recording that's providing this test. And that's out of uh, New York. It's the SUNY Medical Center. And here's all of the information. You specifically can, as a parent and a physician, can contact this lab directly. And they will actually send you directions on how to get the test done. Now, at the time of this recording, um, they don't supply a test kit. So what they'll do is they'll send you what they did for our office is they sent us an email instruction on how to get it done. And it's a simple process, a simple blood draw. And then the test results are sent directly to them. And you can talk, you know, specifically to that to their lab about pricing. On average, it's uh, been about $100. And they're, they've, they've been a fine lab to work with. Um, very respectable, and they, they're very timely in the processing of the blood samples. So <clears throat> if you have a pen and piece of paper, hopefully you can write this down. You can also go at that email address at uh, edward.quadros at downstate.edu, or there's their phone number that you can contact directly. Okay, a couple more seconds here, I'll move on. <clears throat> Again, by the way, this presentation has already been recorded and is available in its entirety from Autism Seminars On Demand. You just go to autismseminarsondemand.com. <clears throat> you can not only re-listen to the audio recording, or that actually not the audio recording, but the entire presentation on video, and have access to the slides too. Okay, let's talk about treatment. Well, if we're using folinic acid, you know, between 0.5 to 3 milligrams per kilogram split dose twice daily is where I start. <clears throat> There's a medication called leucovorin, which is prescription folinic acid, which is uh, more high dose. It comes in a 5 milligram and a 25 milligram tablet. General starting recommendations, starting dose, be conservative here, you know, start low, start slow has been, always been my rule. 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram split dose twice daily. 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate as well can help. Most of the trials for documented cerebral folate deficiency have been with folinic acid. That doesn't mean that 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is going to be harmful. It's just that you know, what's available now as far as literature has really been pinpointed towards folinic acid. <clears throat> Again, I, you know, starting, starting low, starting slow. Um, some kids are real sensitive. So even taking the dose that you figured out and starting at a quarter to half of that is perfectly reasonable. This is not a shotgun treatment. This is not something you'll do for a couple weeks and then sit back and say it didn't work or did work. This is a time commitment that needs to take place over time. And that, that generally means a number of months. <clears throat> Usually, I tend to go pretty slow with this, where we're starting to increase the dose every you know two to four weeks in a real sensitive child, maybe a little bit sooner in a child who's can tolerate supplements more, where it's not that big of an issue, um, but it is something that we want to look to increase over time. It definitely seems to work better if methyl B12 is in place. For many kids, that means the injections, not always. We might get by with a lollipop, maybe the nasal spray, but you know my take, if you haven't done methyl B12 therapy and you haven't done the injection therapy, 
then that's generally where I like to start with kids to really know whether methyl B12 is going to be helpful or not. The side effects are pretty common to many of these different types of therapies for kids. Hyperness, overstimulation can occur. Again, I haven't seen any serious problems, you know, um, <clears throat> no new onset of seizures or heart problems or liver problems or kidney problems. These things have not been an issue. Here is a supplement from New Beginnings, 400 micrograms per capsule. You will find it extremely difficult to reach the levels that are necessary to do cerebral folate replacement by just using a supplement because we're now starting to talk about milligram dosages versus micrograms. And that in many kids, you know, 40, 50 pounds even, sometimes that can mean 15 to 20 capsules a day of just a supplement. Not real practical. And this is where you start to have to work with a physician in order to access the prescription supplement or the prescription strength supplement. Leucovorin is um, one form. It is folinic acid. The 25 milligram folinic acid tablet does contain some dyes. This has primarily been FDA approved for the use in patients taking folic acid inhibiting drugs such as methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis. But in our purposes, it works just fine because we're just looking for a higher dose of folinic acid. <clears throat> and this is available from most pharmacies. And in some cases, I say some, in quotation marks, maybe uh, insurance, uh, you get insurance to pay for it, but that's variable. Methylfolate, okay, again as a supplement available from New Beginnings, is another version. This particular supplement comes as, as 1,000 micrograms per capsule. <clears throat> folate deficiencies in general tend to be common because so many people these days overcook their foods or they don't eat enough vegetables. Um, we might have problems in its conversion because of MTHFR. Certainly we might have autoantibody reactions to the folate receptors and so therefore we know that methylfolate or folinic acid supplementation is useful. Usually on a general patient, if you're just sort of putting together a, a general nutritional supplement program, you know, you might, you'd probably use 1,000 micrograms of methyl tetrahydrofolate daily, okay? But usually that's, generally that's not going to be enough if we're really talking about getting after kids who have cerebral folate deficiency. <clears throat> and trying to do that with a supplement is going to be the same problem we had trying to do folinic acid replacement with just a supplement. Like folinic acid where we could use leucovorin, for methylfolate we can use Deplin. Deplin is a prescription strength supplement of methylfolate. It comes in a 7.5 and 15 milligram tablet and is primarily in this version used for depression. <clears throat> so it is a prescription item. We've already talked about this a little bit here. So folinic acid, we start with 0.5 to 1 milligram uh, per kilogram, split dose twice daily, start to work up. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, I mentioned that it seems to work better with methyl B12 in place. Start low, start slow, increase over time. Okay, so we've touched on that pretty straightforward stuff. With the methylfolate, what I have here we're talking about 250 to 1,000 micrograms daily. That is the, hey, let's put a supplement program together. We'll do some B12. We'll, we'll do the multivitamin, et cetera. And uh, let's do a little bit of methylfolate to see how that helps some kids. That is not the dosage that we're talking about when we're talking about going after a cerebral folate deficiency problem. That's where we start to have to dose it, similar to folinic acid in a much more higher uh, higher level, okay? Where we're getting into the milligram dosages as opposed to the microgram dosages. Experience with methylfolate, clinical experience, is that it can actually help improve seizure threshold somewhere up, you know, sometimes upwards of 10 to 15 milligrams um, throughout the day in some cases, you know, one to two times a day, in some cases two to three times a day. Again, that's clinical experience um, with respect specifically to methylfolate. 
any time you're talking about using a therapy like this to help with seizures is where you really need to work with a physician um, who's knowledgeable about seizure control or the doctor you're working with who prescribed the anti-seizure medication. <clears throat> a couple things that can help uh, or you should avoid as a general recommendation is folic acid supplementation, synthetic folic acid. Folic acid is, is an oxidized form of folate. Okay? It, it has been shown to increase seizures. Now, if your child is taking a multivitamin and it has you know, 200 micrograms uh, or whatever it might be, a real low amount of folic acid, you know, it doesn't mean that that one specific thing is the main culprit for their seizures. I'm just looking at things that you can try and do to reduce any potential. And so if we're going to be using any kind of folate supplementation at all, these days I try to avoid folic acid and use either methylfolate or folinic acid. So what are, the, what are some things that can be seen with respect to folinic or methylfolate more high dose supplementation for CFD? Improvement in language and cognitive processing abilities most definitely, uh, positive changes in irritability, decreasing threshold for seizures, improvements in central nervous system problems, um, kids becoming less spastic, improvements in muscle tone. <clears throat> Usually the earlier the intervention, the better for long-term success. Again, this is not something that you will do just for a couple weeks. What has been recognized within the community who treats cerebral folate deficiency defined or diagnosed is that this can many times be minimally a year or more of therapy. And, and that seems to hold true now with respect to the autism community too. Okay, well, what are some other things that we can think about? <clears throat> well, we know that cerebral folate deficiency appears to be an autoimmune process and that the avoidance of dairy is recommended. It's possible that other autoimmune therapies may be useful. Intravenous immunoglobulin therapy, something that's used in a condition called PANDAS, which is an obsessive compulsive disorder that is triggered by strep. Okay? <clears throat> it's expensive. Steroid therapy may have some usefulness here. Low-dose naltrexone. Low-dose naltrexone is another biomedical therapy that helps regulate autoimmune problems and avoiding folic acid supplementation too. Okay. <clears throat> 